Thank you very much again for joining us uh, for the next instalment of the Nature Trek Online Roadshow. Uh, my name is Georgie. I'm our tailor-made manager. Uh, this will actually be the last um, instalment of our Nature Trek Online Roadshow for 2023. Uh, we've absolutely loved bringing these to your living room again uh, this winter, but don't fear, we will be back early in January uh, when some of my colleagues will be speaking about South America and we'll also be resuming our in-person roadshows. But this evening, uh, we will be discussing our reptile and amphibian holidays. Um, we're starting slightly later this evening uh, because we are joined by some of our tour leaders from all over the world on completely different time zones. Uh, so we're very, very appreciative of them for getting up very early this morning to join us. Um, and I'm also joined by my colleague, Dan Lay, who is our herpetology expert in the office. Um, Dan started running our specialist reptile and amphibian holidays uh, about five years ago now. And if you've been on one of those already, or if you've been thinking about a reptile and amphibian holiday, it's probably Dan that you've been speaking to, as he's uh, certainly our expert in the office. Um, but we're also joined by our colleagues from all over the world. Uh, we've got Tyrone Ping, who will be joining us from South Africa this evening uh, to talk about our reptile and amphibian holidays there. Uh, we've got Richard, who's joining us from Osaka this evening. Uh, he'll be speaking about our tours to Japan and in particular the, the quest for the river dragon. And lastly, this evening, we've got Steve, who will be joining us from Australia. OK, can you uh, see my screen? Yeah, that Everything all looks good okay. here. Perfect. Thanks, Excellent. Richard. OK, my pleasure. So, um, ohayo gozaimasu. Good morning from Osaka, Japan. Um, I'm just in Osaka for a short trip, so I'm here in a hotel room. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, a pioneering herping and culture tour in Japan called Quest for the River Dragon. And first, I will talk to you a, a little bit about the the tour leader, which is myself, and also the uh, expert super team that I put together to introduce each region and each region's um, hope to fauna. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the actual uh, fantastic species that we're hoping to see and probably can see. And then a little bit about the, uh, the culture element of this trip, because uh, you can't really come to Japan and not at least try and get some sense of the uh, very special culture here. Um, yeah, and then a little bit about things like, you know, practical things like accommodation, food, that kind of thing. And I'll just start my timer because I tend to talk for too long about Japanese giant salamanders when I get excited. Uh, so without further ado, um, let's move this so I can read what I'm saying. So just to cover some of the, um, the, special features of this tour or the highlights if you like so as the name suggests the uh, river dragon it's not an actual dragon obviously um, but that's a name that's sometimes given to the japanese giant salmon and first of all uh, we have an excellent chance of seeing the Japan uh, japanese giant salmon in the wild and learning about well, my efforts to conserve them with uh, various guest scientists. Um, obviously, as I'm sure you're all aware, they can never say there's a 100% chance of seeing any particular species in the world. But given the timing um, and my knowledge of the area we'll be visiting, I would say there's as close to 100% as you can possibly get whilst it's still being a, a natural non-fate tour. Um, so yes, almost 100% chance. And then uh, this tour visits very different regions of Japan. So uh, we also head to the tropical region, almost uh, um, in Taiwan, which is Okinawa. And there's some superstar species down there as well. And just two that I've highlighted here are the uh, Anderson's crocodile newt and the Ryuku black-breasted leaf turtle very uh, photogenic um, uh, creatures. And then of course, again, just uh, about the, the culture side. So we will be uh, visiting very different regions. So we'll um, start off in Tokyo 
and we'll have some time to visit some of the major sites. So that's obviously a, a mega city, uh, the world's largest city, but it's also very safe and, and very clean and very interesting. And then we've also got Kyoto there, which is the, the old cultural capital of Japan with very high number of world heritage sites. And then also uh, when we're in Kyoto near there is uh, Japan's largest freshwater lake, which is Lake Biwa. So we'll spend time there. And again, just, you know, it's going to be, uh, I, I, I'm also, a, 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 I'm, I'm basically a nature and adventure guide, but I've also been doing cultural tours in Japan for over 10 years. So I can give you an insight to various uh, aspects of the Japanese special culture. And an important part is that uh, really excellent photographic opportunities with not just expert um, reptile and amphibian guides, but also expert photographers. And we will see some of the amazing photographs taken by our regional guides as we go through this tour. A very important aspect, I think, and I think quite an, ex uh, an exciting angle, is that basically this is a, a, a first, a pioneering tour. Japan doesn't have ecotourism as the West kind of knows it. So this is, as far as I can see, this is the first ever uh, reptile and amphibian um, tour of Japan by anyone, by any company. So um, it can make a really big difference and, and also sort of introduce to Japan how important these uh, wonderful, amazing and uh, sensitive creatures are to the wider world, which I hope then will encourage stronger and, and better uh, conservation practices. Okay, so moving on. Um, me, about me. So I'm originally from the Cotswolds in the UK. I trained as a, a safari guide in Tyrone's home country in South Africa many moons ago. And I also spent time doing biodiversity surveys. I've been based in rural Japan for 15 of the last 17 years. I had no interest in Japan before I came here, to be honest. So my love for Japan is, I guess you could describe as organic. And just, you know, I came, loved it, and um, I've stayed pretty much. And like I've mentioned before, I, I'm my main focus, especially these days, is on uh, nature guiding and adventure guiding, such as cycling tours and hiking tours. Um, and I've been doing that since 2013. Uh, specific reference to um, amphibians. So I've been providing Japanese giant salamander conservation and viewing tours since 2017, when the Japanese Ministry of Environment uh, asked me for some help in getting a, a tour going. They'd been planning one for a while, but didn't quite have the expertise to do it. So once I learned about that and sort of fell in love with the giant salamanders myself, I realized that, you know, well, one, how truly special they are and also the pretty difficult situation they face. So I decided to take on, you know, the mission to help them out myself. And it's pretty much become 90% of my life and my uh, my wife's life these days. So, you know, for good and bad, mostly good. Um, so I, I uh, established a, a non-profit organization called Sustainable Dyson, which you can look up online if you uh, so wish in 2021. And we've also uh, launched a Save the Japanese Giant Salamander uh, campaign around the same time. Um, I'm the first and only ever uh, non-Japanese licensed Japanese giant salamander handler and researcher. They're protected by law here that only licensed people can touch them or handle them in, in any way. And there's very few uh, people qualified to do that in Japan. I had to jump through a lot more hoops, but I finally managed to get there and means I'm able to conduct research in the area. And practice with Shugendo. Shugendo is uh, like an ancient mountain 
religion in Japan. So a big part of my mission is to try to almost remind Japan, if it's okay for me to do that, uh, about, the, you know, famously that they, they had a very deep and strong and, and good relationship with nature. But definitely since around 100 years, they, they, they've kind of less so and lost their way a little bit. So a big part of our project is the education side and trying to reconnect Japanese people to nature. Okay, that's me. Um, this So uh, just about the Japanese giant salamander campaign, uh, my efforts are focused on the Nawa River Basin, which is in um, Totori Prefecture, the most rural prefecture in Japan, has the smallest population. And basically, again, you can read more about this on our website if you if you like. But basically, we, we are taking a kind of holistic approach where we're doing practical conservation, organic farming, chemical free farming, I should say, and also elements of forest rewilding. And here is an example of some of the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years. So in the top left there, there was a, a tunnel that I found uh, with a huge blockage in a very important breeding area. So the US Marines joined me from a base here, uh, and we managed to clear this several tons of debris. And also we constructed some bypass ramps by lifting these heavy rocks. So as you imagine, the US Marines are probably the best volunteer base you could ever dream of. In the bottom left corner, we've had uh, international experts come over and we've uh, made some nest boxes and shelters with leading researchers. And in the bottom right, you've got uh, Dr. Amel Boise in the, in the foreground here. He's the um, co-chair of the IUCN, SSC Amphibian Specialist Group. So the world's top amphibian expert, pretty much. And he's joined us with a, a, a team of international experts a couple of times. So we're really doing some pretty pioneering stuff ourselves. Um, okay, moving on before I talk too much. So when we spend time in uh, the Kyoto and Lake Biwa area, we'll be joined by Shintaro Seki. And he is a legend and superstar amphibian and reptile person in Japan. He operates a couple of uh, non-profit organizations, including an, uh, an aquarium and breeding uh, center that we can visit. And he's actually published more than 67 um, books with photographs for each and every species. So yeah, if there's something he doesn't know, then nobody knows it, I'd say. Um, but interesting, so he told me that he's always dreamed of uh, guiding non-Japanese visitors um, and teaching them about Japan's herptofauna. So this is his, uh, so if you come, you can help him fulfill his dream. What more could you possibly ask for on a trip? Okay, and then moving on. So when we get to Okinawa, uh, our local guide, it's uh, an English fellow like myself called Mark Thorpe. He's uh, an incredible uh, photographer and video, uh, vid videographer. He's been in uh, Okinawa for several years. He's he's won many awards. And as you can see, he also used to be uh, a film producer and cameraman at National Geographic Television and Film. And shortly we will see some of his incredible work. So as I mentioned before, this is a really great experience to learn tips about f uh, photography as well, well as learn about the um, herptofauna of Japan. And Seki-san and Mark are both extremely uh, friendly people who are more than happy to share their expertise with you. And then finally, kind of a little bit of a, a bonus one I've managed to organize is that um, Professor Kevin Messenger, He's a professor of uh, professor at the uh, Herptology and Applied Conservation Lab in, in Nanjing, and he's also a co-coordinate 
co-coordinator for the IUCN Viper Specialist Group in East Asia and also an author. Uh, Kevin worked with me in the summer doing uh, habitat surveys for the giant salamanders and we also spent a lot of time looking for uh, mamushi and other Japanese um, endemic snakes. Um, so he's he's agreed to join us in Okinawa. So when we're in the field, any, any vipers we find, we've got one of the top world leading researchers on hand to uh, help us maneuver it into a, a, a nice position and, and teach us everything about it in a, a, the safest possible way, of course. Okay, so just a bit about the Japanese giant sandmander. And again, I need to be careful here because I could talk for days. I'll try not to do that. So I believe I've got about eight minutes left in total. So what makes it a special animal? Well, it's one of the largest amphibians in the world. It's one of only a few of the giant salamander species with other species being found in North America, which is the hellbender. Then you've got a couple of species recognized now in China and then the Japanese giant salamander. And the Chinese one is a little bit bigger than the Japanese one, um, but still it's possible for the Japanese giant salamander to reach up to one and a half meters. That's five feet in old money, I believe, in the wild. Um, I would say the ones that we see, to be honest, when we see the smaller ones, it's more exciting. So it's a better sign for the health of the environment that, that, that we find them in. Uh, but generally anywhere between 20 centimeters and 80 to 90 centimeters, if we're lucky, are the ones that we'll be coming across. Heaviest record individual was 44.3 kilos. Again, that's very rare. <laughs> more sort of around five to seven to eight kilos would be a pretty big size where we're going. Uh, they live in streams and rivers their whole life. Um, they're considered fully aquatic, even though they are capable of coming out now and again, but that's almost, that never happens to be honest. I've never seen it other than going over the odd rock here and there. Amazingly, it's thought that they can live up to a hundred years uh, based on um, past records and yeah and a very cool feature is that it's it's had its basically similar body shape now for something like 23 million years it basically hasn't changed in almost 23 million years so it's considered a living fossil it's has a lot of trouble um unfortunately um which obviously i can talk more about when you visit japan um but they're considered, so they're considered vulnerable on the red list, the IUCN red list, and also on the Japanese uh, red list. And as I mentioned before, it's classified as a special national monument, which means uh, only licensed people can handle it. However, that protection doesn't do anything about the problems with the habitat. Um, so dams and agricultural weirs, are causing problems as long with along with hybridization with the ch introduced Chinese giant salamander species and obviously pollution as well. Okay, and then this is just a quick introduction um, to where we'll be studying. If you look in the top right in the background there, that's Mount Daisen, the largest mountain in the Chugoku region, is and I live halfway up that mountain. And the river's coming off the north side. So just out of uh, picture shot here is the Sea of Japan. So these short rivers coming down from this sacred mountain have very oxygen rich and cool water, which means that this makes this habitat a very special and unique one. It's the lowest altitude breeding habitat for any giant salamander anywhere in the world. So we believe it should have more protection than anywhere else by his, uh, and by force, but it has very little, so that's something we're working on. And you can just see, so the names of the rivers that make up the basin are there in, in the corner, but just to show you that might surprise some people is that the water de depth where we'll find salamanders, even 80, 90 centimeter ones sometimes, can be as little as 10 centimeters. 
So just pretty much so that the fish swim in front of their their um their jaws. So we put waders on and we walk up through there. It's not a kind of snorkeling and swimming with monsters kind of experience. It's it's very much a conservation based study. Okay. And just a quick more, I'm gonna just move a bit quicker now. So this is the distribution through the center of Honshu, and you can see there's some other um uh, pockets of of salamanders elsewhere, but the arrow points to where uh, we are. And if you can see, actually, it's the only place really that it joins onto the Sea of Japan coast on that side. Okay, quick introduction to some of the other species that we're hoping to see. So uh, the, the two frogs at the top are actually the same species, the Ishikawa's frog. It's basically considered Japan's most beautiful frog, but I guess that's subjective, but it is obviously very beautiful. Um, and this is the blue morph and green morph. Uh, unfortunately, they're endangered due to habitat loss mostly. And then we've got uh, the Ry Ryuku Kajika frog, quite a common frog, um, will potentially set in various different habitats. Another um, Oh, I'm sorry, I need to go back there. Just got to move something out of the way so I can see my own screen. Yeah, the Ryuku tip nosed frog, um, also an endangered species, but it's one that we're likely to see from my experience. Moving on, so something about the snakes. So we've got the prize kill back, um, fairly common one. Uh, then we've also got the Formosan odd scale snake. Got a couple of different names, but that's the one that generally we use. And again, just to be clear, the, these photographs were taken by Mark Thorpe. So he will be with us in the field when, when we, uh, you know, find a species. So he can teach us how he gets these amazing shots. And then we've got the, so Habu, Habu are famously the, 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 the most venomous viper group in Japan. And we've got three species that we're uh, likely to see or hopefully you can see we've got so in the bottom left we have the okinawa habu and then we've got the on the right here we've got the introduced species which is the taiwan habu quite common species so again almost guaranteed to see these and there's one more called the hime habu which stands for princess so yeah that's a beautiful one and then we've got the, also the odd tooth snake uh there quite a, again fairly common one and then some of the real superstars, lucky finds, um, but again, good chance to see them is the Ryuku black breasted leaf turtle, the uh, Kudo Iwa ground gecko. Uh, unfortunately, this is very popular in the pet trade, so there's been a big problem with poaching. Um, and then this guy looks like he's only got two legs, but I promise you he hasn't. It's the Anderson crocodile newt. Uh, yeah, that's a really photogenic one. And also, that one's also, like the Japanese giant salamander, it's considered a, a living fossil. As you can see, it looks pretty much like a, a dinosaur. Okay, and then just to touch on, I think I'm a little bit over, so I'll just whiz through this part. So, like I said, Japan, very unique place, separated from the rest of the world for centuries. Um, so it has, you know, very unique and special culture. So we'll get... Obviously, just by being here, we can experience that. And so in Kyoto, we can visit some of these famous sites, amongst others, and wander around. Um, and just to touch on accommodation, we have yet yeah, quality three or four star hotels in Tokyo, Kyoto, and Inago. So those are the three areas on the mainland of uh, main island of Honshu, I should say. And then we'll also be staying at this beautiful beach resort which is you know not something that people always do when it comes to japan but just where you know where we'll be looking this is the best place to stay for sure and we can enjoy swimming and you know touch of luxury at the end of the trip okay um and so i said obviously i don't really have time to go into it now but japanese food is incredible um you know and it's a, a very special feature so we'll definitely have that Shouldn't really talk about food when I've got a picture of the Japanese giant salamander on the screen, but that was an accident. So, Yokoso, 
welcome to Japan, and we hope to see you uh, next year. Thank you so much, Richard. That's brilliant. Yeah, fantastic introduction to Japan. Certainly sort of, um, yeah, we'll start our appetite for that. So hopefully Tyrone should have um, got back his screen now. There we go. So good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for your patience with the few technical difficulties I'm just experiencing at the moment. Um, I'm going to chat to you guys a little bit more about our KZN tour. Um, that's obviously KZN in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa where we are going to embark on exploring a little bit of the reptile diversity that we do get across in Quasar and Intel. Um, just a little breakdown. <clears throat> We're going to just chat about who I am and what I'm doing and why I'm talking to you guys tonight. Uh, why possibly looking at Quasar and Intel to come and explore on a reptile-based holiday. We're going to talk about photographing reptiles, the risks that come with that, or the risks that don't come with that in this case, um, snakes and safety. And then we're going to deep dive into the nature check program and just give you guys a little bit more of a breakdown. But first things first, my name is Tyron Ping and I am based here in South Africa. I'm currently based in Cape Town, but I grew up in KwaZulu-Natal where I spent most of my life. So it's safe to say I know KwaZulu-Natal and its reptiles fairly well growing up. I had most of these animals running around in my backyard, so it makes it fairly easy. Um, what I have done is over the last couple of years, I've started to write several field guides on the region. The latest field guide is Snakes and Other Reptiles of the Western Cape. And before that was Snakes and Other Reptiles of KwaZulu-Natal. So it's actually been the first field guide of its kind for the region. So safe to say, that you're in relatively good hands when it comes to the snakes and other reptiles um, on this upcoming tour. So first of all, we'll kick off with why KwaZulu-Natal. Um, South Africa is a pretty large and diverse country with nine provinces. KwaZulu-Natal is one of the, I would probably say, maybe perhaps biased, but one of the best provinces in terms of weather. We have over 300 sunny days in the year, which means we also experience a lot of rain. We have diverse habitats from these beautiful coastal forests, which all of these following slides we will, we will be exploring in sort of great detail in the upcoming tour. We've got the coastal forests of the Isimangalisi Wetland Park. We've got the high altitude Drakonsberg Mountains. We take it all the way back to Cozy Bay, which is right on the South African Mozambican border. Um, a nice, beautiful estuarine system. We can see they've got these ancient fish traps that um, the locals um, use in an ethical way to harvest uh, fish from the environment. Um, we look at the Natal Midlands, which traditionally was a really large habitat filled with thick, dense forests. It's now being cleared for a lot of farming, but there are still an amazing diversity of grassland species, including the endemic Natal Midlands dwarf chameleon, which is going to be a really a highlight of animals to see on our trip, which can still be found in the region uh, with relative ease, if you know where you're looking. Um, we then head to an area in the northern part of the province called Zululand, which is obviously famous for things like black mambas, um, the, your big five, of course, and not to mention your megafauna. Um, although it is a reptile-based and focused, reptile amphibian-based focused tour, we'll obviously, we'll never pass up the opportunity to see fantastic megafauna, everything from big cats, giraffes, antelope, and of course, the elephants. Um, when it comes to photographing reptiles on these sort of tours, it's open to an array of people. You know, we do have people that come on tours that simply are happy with, you know, just getting a quick cell phone shot of an animal, um, you know, maybe just looking at it really closely and moving on. And we get guys like this, who have got their lighting rigs, their lighting setups, and, you know, want to get really up close and personal with the animals, which is perfectly fine. Um, we obviously just make sure the animals are always... Uh, front of mind so we don't over photograph animals or have too many people photographing animals at the same time um, but yeah if you want to get beautiful shots macro if you've got a whole set of macro photography gear you want to get to um, which I am that way inclined so you know take very nice um, detailed photograph of animals so that's also um, right up my alley and 
When it comes to dealing with venomous snakes, you'll see here we've got a little Eastern Shield Nose snake. This is found right on the border of Mozambique and South Africa. Very rare snake in the region. And, and the possibilities of bumping into these animals in Zuland, it's just a road cruise away most of the time. And when it comes to snakes and safety, obviously safety of everyone on our tours is always our primary concern. So if you're a little bit nervous around venomous snakes, for example, you are never going to be on the situation where you're just left with a venomous snake if you want to take pictures and everyone goes about and does their own thing. And I'm always the one in control of venomous snakes. I've been handling and dealing with venomous snakes uh, for probably the last 20 years. I grew up, like I said, in KwaZulu-Natal where we had black mambas occasionally coming through the backyard. We had boomslung um, in the trees. So I've been dealing with venomous snakes for a very long time, from a very young age. So um, we do everything safely using all the correct gear. And speaking of the correct gear, you'll see here, this is a black mamba in a perspex tube. And that also gives us a really nice opportunity for people to get really close up and get really beautiful pictures of black mambas with virtually no risk to them. Uh, as you can see, I'm holding the black mamba at the base of the tube so the snake cannot reverse. Um, while you still allow the head to protrude safely, and you're able to get really nice photographs knowing that you're completely safe. And um, you can see we use these tubes quite often. And this is an incredibly large Mozambique spitting cobra, which is a, quite a common species in Northern KZN, as the name suggests, and as you can see from my eyewear, uh, these snakes do spit or spray their venom. So again, safety is always gonna be a top priority when dealing with um, the snakes, especially on, on the tour in a nocturnal environment where these snakes are quite active. So we're just gonna have a little breakdown of what the tour entails, the sort of animals we can expect to see on the tour. Um, you can see we are concentrating from Durban. We move northwards up the coast and then we bump around to several game reserves and several key spots along the coast, which we call Zululand and going right up the coast to Cozy Bay, which sits on the Mozambique border. So we arrive in Durban and it's actually a place where I grew up. So I'm very well familiar with the animals that are in, in and amongst the suburbs. So uh, this is a little flat neck chameleon sleeping on a little piece of grass. You just woke up for the photograph. And um, yeah, we're in Durban. And these are some of the key species that we are likely to see in the region. Um, from left to right, we have your uh, KwaZulu Natal Dwarf Chameleon. Um, this little cute tree frog with the bright red eyes is a member of the Leptopelis or the tree frogs. And that's the Natal tree frog. On the bottom left, we've got a green water snake. And the reason these animals are all pictured together is often on our nocturnal surveys where we're looking for chameleons and frogs, you often find these sleeping green snakes um, in the foliage typically quite close to water, and it makes quite an exciting nocturnal search when you're not only looking for calling frogs, sleeping chameleons, but you're looking for sleeping green snakes in the branches. And um, of course, we have the vervet monkey, which is also called the blue monkey, uh, which are quite common amongst the suburban environments. And um, I will tell you on our recent tour to Limpopo and the northern parts of Kuzu Natal, I was a victim to a few vervet monkeys who snuck through my hotel window and stole a knife lo loaf of sour bread off my table. So you got to watch out for the monkeys when you come to Southern Africa. And uh, the next stop is going to probably be one of my favorite parts of the tour is we head to the Natal Midlands and look for the iconic Natal Midlands dwarf chameleon, which you see pictured in front of you. Several other key species um, along the way in the Natal Midlands, we've got this really unique lizard on the left-hand side called the coppery grass lizard. As you can see, it's very serpentine in nature, has a very long elongated tail. Tail makes up about 60% of the body and it's got tiny little ball limbs and rear limbs. And um, unfortunately, people often mistake these animals for snakes and they are feared amongst the community when they really don't need to be. Um, and another iconic species of the Natal Midlands is the banded wrinkles, another venomous snake which superficially resembles a cobra. They can both spit and spray their venom and always a welcome sight to see um, when you're walking through the high altitude grasslands. And when startled, they spread 
a formidable hood and they hiss and spit to their heart's content. And on the bottom left, we have the common crag lizard, another beautiful lizard, which is quite common in the high altitude regions, often sitting on the edge of rocks and basking. So it allows you to get quite close and, and get some really nice photographs. One of the most exciting species we are likely to see on the Central Midlands Lake is this chameleon in the bottom center here. It is known only as the emerald dwarf chameleon. It is a undescribed species of dwarf chameleon of the Bradypodium. And although the species has been known to science since the early 1980s, it remains a mystery in terms of where it fits in with the other animals. So uh, it is not formally described to science. You won't really see it in any field guides. And hopefully it is described soon because it is a beautiful chameleon and is only really known from the high altitude regions in the Natal Midlands. And of course, there are um, much larger animals to be seen. The zebra are quite a common sighting, as well as things like your elant and other small antelope. As we go up into the Midlands, we will never pass up the opportunity to see um, some nice, interesting mammals. And even in our nocturnal searches, um, it is not uncommon to see animals like serval and genet um, while we are out, out at night looking for chameleons. So there's really something for everyone, you know, although it's not specifically a general tour, um, we will likely encounter some really interesting nocturnal mammals. We then go from the Natal Midlands and we head towards the coast, a small coastal town called Mtumzini. Pictured here is the southern twig snake, also called the vine snake, and South Africa is also call it the bird snake. You can see it's got a beautiful red tongue, a highly venomous snake, um, and there is no antivenom for this species, although they're very shy and docile, so they really, really bite people, and it's really not an animal that is the cause of any great concern. Um, we explore the beautiful raffia palm forests, as you can see on the bottom right, of Intimzini, and likely animals that we will be encountering are things like a forest cobra on the top left. A common species of green snake called the Eastern Natal green snake, often seen zipping through the foliage and on any sort of, um, <clears throat> any sort of artificial cover, always nice to see them. And then Imsimzinia is also hosts a plethora of amphibian species. We can see these really tiny water lily frogs on the left here, and the iconic spotted shovel nose frog up in Africa. They also call them the pig nose frog, which you can see why. And um, so all of these animals are quite likely uh, to encounter on our sort of excursions throughout Umsumzini. We then move further northwards to a really, really interesting town, probably one of my favorite places in KwaZulu-Natal to look for reptiles, the town of St. Lucia. And before we get started on the reptile diversity, St. Lucia is a famous town for having hippos that wander the streets. You can see this image on the bottom left. It may look photoshopped, but um, the hippos do roam the streets at night, especially even on rainy, cool afternoons. Um, and that is the main road in St. Lucia. And it's not uncommon to see the hippos waltzing around there during the day. And um, one of the other ama main attractions of St. Lucia We've got the Sotaro's dwarf chameleon, as you can see in this front center frame, a beautiful little chameleon, which was first described from the town of St. Lucia in the late eighties. Below that, we have one of South Africa's few, um, what we call a poisonous frog. Um, they, they really just excrete a bit of a toxin from the skin. So if you touch it, it does nothing to your hands, but if you happen to put it in your eyes, your mouth, um, gives you a bit of a unpleasant reaction. We've got the ever present, Eastern hinge tortoise on the top left and below, followed by the iconic Eastern green mamba. So Lucia is a really nice coastal town um, flanked with coastal forests, which turn into dune forests and straight onto the beach. So green mambas are a high probability um, to see in the town once we walk on the little, on the trails. We met, then move further northwards uh, into the town of Cozy Bay, which again, like I said, is right on the border of Mozambique and South Africa. Pictured here is an iconic animal from Northern KZN. This is the Eastern Gaboon Adder or the Eastern Gaboon Viper, depending on where in the world you are. Um, one of the largest 
one of the snakes with the largest fangs throughout Southern Africa. So um, these are really on the top list of everyone that ever visits Northern Kazadin. Any uh, snake enthusiast or reptile enthusiast will surely recognize the Kabunada. And finding these really will be the cherry on top of the trip. Um, not a common species to find, but there's always a possibility. And we'll just go through and look at some of the smaller animals. I am really fond of the smaller, lesser known species, especially when you go on tours. Everyone knows the green mambas, the black mambas, much like your big five when it comes to mammals. But I really like to show and share my interests in the smaller, lesser known species. On the top left, we have the giant legless skink, completely harmless uh, lizard species, which is again, often confused with snakes. Um, we probably have the grumpiest genus of frogs in all of the world. I'll put my, put my head up and I'll say they definitely are. This is the breviceps, also known as the rain frogs. And um, throughout the region, we probably could encounter up to four different species of rain frogs. The beautiful Eastern tiger snake with its orange and black markings all the way through the body, often found in and around the lodges as they hunt for geckos and lizards that sleep in the rafters. Um, we have the painted reed frog, another beautiful species, really common all throughout the region and highly likely we will encounter several hundred of them. They are very common. And just a closer look at the sustainable fishing methods um, in the Cozy Bay Estuary, where the locals obviously set these traps up. And obviously with the small gaps between the wood, small fish are able to exit while the larger fish are then harvested for the local community. And it is just a, a really ancient method of fishing, and it is really nice to see the tradition carrying on. So next we head to Mkumbi Lodge, and there are several slides here, because we'll be based here for three days, where we then explore um, two really beautiful game reserves that are just within a stone's throw of the lodge. And here we've got a little rock monitor, which is actually photographed at Mkumbi Lodge, where we'll be stationed. Uh, for three days and the reptile diversity in and around the lodge is fantastic so night walks are really really good and uh, even just on downtown downtime during the day a beautiful place to explore and find reptiles and amphibians and um, as you can see here we've got an eastern natal green snake feeding on a velvet gecko and that was photographed at the lodge right in front of someone's room as they were exiting so it's a Incredible place to see reptiles and amphibians, literally on your front doorstep. And the puffadder, another common species across the region. On our nocturnal drives, we are quite likely to see these, these snakes as they are quite abundant throughout the region, particularly after it's rained. Um, another really cute frog species on the bottom here, we have the mottled shovel nose frog, also called the mottled pig nose frog, and you can see why. And another common species of cobra is the forest cobra, which is found all throughout the Mkumbi Lodge. They can often be seen shooting across the path as you are sort of walking through. And again, these snakes are very fast and agile, and they just want to get away from people as quickly as possible. So there are lots of venomous snakes around, and most of them just want to escape and have nothing to do with you. So if you're fortunate, you'll see them zipping across the path up the nearest tree, chasing after a bird or the abundant red tree squirrels. Um, and Kumbi Lodge is actually named after the red dacre, which you can see on the bottom right here. It's a very small species of antelope. And in the early mornings and late afternoons coming in and out of the lodge, you often see them quietly shooting through the undergrowth. Um, also very photogenic animals. So, um, if you've had a full day of reptiles and amphibians, uh, you know, getting a, a good dose of the small mammals is a, quite a nice break. Um, just to carry on again, being based in Mkumbi, and you can see on the top right here, there's a really interesting observation of a Eastern forest cobra feeding on a wood hoopoe, which was taken at the lodge. So the reptile and bird diversity is incredible. Uh, as well as the mammals, we have the a male Nyala in the front in center here, and below that, we've got the rather cute greater bush baby, as we call them locally. And um, throughout the lodge, you can often hear them bouncing from tree to tree or every now and again, they'll visit your, um, your room and you'll see them on the balustrades and the balconies. And they usually appreciate a quick photograph and they're not too shy. Um, 
We've got a beautiful southern triagama on your top left. Again, really common species to encounter throughout the region. And the males show these brilliant blues and emeralds and oranges and yellows. Um, and also just, again, to connect with our birds, if we have sort of people that are interested in the general diversity, the crested guinea fowl is um, quite a special find in the area and really restricted to the sand forest where Mkumbi is based. Sand forest is one of the smallest uh, remaining vegetation types in northern Zuland. Uh, a lot of the area is being transformed into farming or it's thick, dense coastal forest. The sand forest really hosts a plethora of life. So crested guinea fowl, again, always a nice um, site. They generally move around in small groups. Okay, just to continue again on Nkumbi as we sort of wind down, um, like I said previously, I'm really interested in the small unknown reptile species. So I always do go out of my way to find things like the low felt dwarf burrowing skink on your top left here. Again, it may look superficially just like a snake, but you can see it's got really small rear limbs with that electric blue tail. Um, we've got the, the worm slung, which is a very iconic species throughout Africa. And um, this is a male in the front center here. Um, worm, obviously the Afrikaans word for tree. Slung is the Afrikaans word for snake. So together that's worm slung. Um, people often think it's boom slang, but there's no SH in it. It's just boom slung. And as well as the plethora of reptile species, uh, Adam Kumbi, we can also see the giraffe, which is not an uncommon species to see just outside of the sand forest, as well as the white rhino, which we'll see in the Shishlui Ampelosi game reserve. There are no dangerous megafauna at Adam Kumbi Lodge. There are leopards, um, which you can occasionally see at night, but those don't pose any risk. So you're completely safe to walk around the lodge and we will do several guided um, walks in the, in the morning as well as the evening. So our chances to see some nocturnal animals like leopards. Um, we can even set up a few of our camera traps and we can see which animals come and visit you outside of your accommodation. We also have the Southern African Python uh, on your left here. Another beautiful thing about the region is in KwaZulu-Natal, we have the largest venomous snake, uh, that being the black mamba. We have the largest non-venomous snake being the Southern African Python. And KwaZulu-Natal is also home to the smallest species of snake in South Africa, which is the thread snake, a snake that measures only about 15 to 18 centimeters in length. Of course, we have been neglecting the tortoises. Uh, we have a leopard tortoise on the bottom right, which um, again, after the rains, these animals can be quite common and they just make beautiful photo photographic subjects. So that is uh, our cuisine Natal in a nutshell. Sorry for racing through that a little bit. I'm just conscious of time. Um, but that is Kwazulu Natal. I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys would like to put in the chat or if we have a QA and um, afterwards. And if you guys have any other questions, I'm sure Dan will be more than willing to answer them as we have recently just come back from a trip to Northern Kwazulu Natal. So both Dan and I will be able to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Tyrone, for a fantastic introduction to South Africa. Um, Steve, are you with us now? Come in, Steve. And can you hear me? I can hear you now, perfect. Oh, good, okay, I was on mute. So <laughs> I shall um, share screen. Fantastic. And begin. That's great. Have we got you there? We're here. That's brilliant. Thank okay. you very much, Steve. Good. Over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, g'day, welcome to Australia. And uh, we do actually say g'day in Australia. It's not an affectation. Um, a little bit about uh, myself first. Um, I'm a herpetologist uh, based in Queensland. Um, I've worked at the Queensland Museum since the 1980s. And I've been very fortunate to live in a continent with a ridiculously high biodiversity um, in terms of, uh, well, we've got over a thousand species of reptiles in Australia. Um, can we hear me okay here? I'm just trying yeah, to... Yeah, we can hear you fine. We haven't got your video, but we have got your screen. Trying to proceed with my... Uh, here we are, yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, 
Yeah, we've got, uh, at last count, 1,137 described species of Australian reptiles. Um, I've made it my uh, life's passion to see as many of them as I can, and I'm very fortunate to have been able to um, author and co-author quite a few books on Australian herpetology. This is a few of them here. Uh, included is the Complete Guide to Australia, which is in its sixth edition. I'm working on edition seven now. Um, what I'm proposing is a tour to three biodiverse hotspots in Australia. Now, Australia is huge. To fly from here to here is about a five or six hour flight between, say, Brisbane and Perth. Um, so we won't be doing that. Um, this area here is called the wet tropics. And uh, that's where I'll be starting. I'll be then proceeding through to what we call the top end of the Northern Territory and then down into Central Australia. So the wet tropics, these dark green areas are essentially World Heritage Tropical Rainforest. Uh, going from sea level through to Montane Heath. Um, it includes a number of regional towns and, and um, developed areas and pristine, fabulous um, areas for herpetology. This is a very typical view of, uh, of the wet tropics. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to some of the things that we'll be hoping to find there. Um, starting with this iconic chameleon gecko. Now, a feature of the wet tropics is the high level of endemism. Uh, huge numbers of uh, plant, animal species are found nowhere but the wet tropics. That includes this chameleon gecko. Um, it's fairly easy to find with a head torch. The technique for finding nocturnal geckos is to locate them by their eye shine. These are often sitting head downwards on saplings. This one has a regenerated tail. The original tail has got white rings on it. Um, an interesting thing about this gecko, it's the only one I know of in the world that when the tail is broken, the actual tail makes a noise. It stridulates <laughs> as it wriggles around. I've never seen it on any other reptile. Another very common uh, reptile in the wet tropics, very easy to see as the, uh, the the northern leaf tail gecko. Um, by day, they're in the uh, the buttressed trunks of the giant figs and sometimes sitting exposed and camouflaged on the outer surfaces of trunks. And uh, at night, they've got that really nice bright eye shine. You can pick them up by torchlight. Uh, a feature of Australian... Um, habitats right across the whole continent is a very high number of skinks. Uh, Tyrone mentioned some of the burrowing skinks in Southern Africa. We have a whole range of skinks here, more than 400 species. So uh, anytime you're, mo you're moving through any Australian habitat, the most likely things you'd be seeing is skinks. This is another wet tropic endemic, a tiny little moisture loving leaf litter inhabiting four fingered skink. Underneath the logs, these very abundant prickly forest skinks, um, another wet tropics endemic. They believe that the um, rough scales uh, to disperse moisture across the surface. In some areas, virtually every single log has a, a prickly forest skink living under it. If you're fortunate, you'll see the Boyd's forest dragons. There are some areas where they're reasonably easy to see. Uh, including at Lake Boreen, where these two were both photographed. And the, the benefits of Lake Boreen, it's a perched volcanic lake surrounded by rainforest. And it also hosts an excellent um, little tea house. So you can have your, have your Devonshire teas, look out over the lake at the turtles swimming around, and then take a walk through the tropical rainforest and see these Boyd's forest dragons. They're not a swift animal. They just sit quietly on the tree trunks. They'll slide around the other side out of view, but usually when you see a Boyd's Forest Dragon, you're able to get your cameras out and get nice, decent photographs like this. Australia's largest python, Australia's largest snake, is uh, right through the wet tropics and then on up into Cape York. The amethyst python, um, 
around about five metres is a is a moderately large individual. Uh, they've evolved to prey on things like large wallabies. Uh, we have a, a number of uh, what we call the colubrid snakes, the um, harmless, non-venomous uh, tree snakes, and the freshwater snake. This is one of the few Australian snakes that's able to prey on introduced and highly toxic uh, cane toads or marine toads and usually survive. It's a bit of Russian roulette as far as the snake goes, though they do sometimes succumb. Australia has um, a level of infamy, I suppose, by the, the number of um, highly venomous elapid snakes that we have, including the taipan. Um, they're not easy to see, but along the edges of the cane fields, the sugar cane fields throughout the wet tropics, on a nice warm morning, there's a reasonable chance of seeing one um, lying out on the edge of the cane. And uh, we don't have any vipers in Australia, but we do have viper analogues, which are the death adders. There are lapids, um, front fang venomous land snakes with, uh, with uh, fixed fangs, unlike the hinged fangs of vipers. Um, but they have the same life strategy of being a, uh, a sedentary, sit and wait, concealed, fast striking snake with a little segmented tail tip that it can lure its prey. There's a couple of areas in the wet tropics. Uh, there's a couple of roads that are very good to drive along um, where there's a good chance of seeing these death adders. And bandy bandies are right through Eastern Australia. Um, so in rainforest, the eucalypt forest, they've got this weird habit of throwing the body up into contorted hoops as a, as a distraction from predators. This is an exclusive snake eater it feeds almost entirely on uh, little harmless burrowing snakes called blind snakes. And then, of course, at Lake Berene, you've got all of these turtles. Very easy to see. Great photographic subjects. And, of course, the frogs. There's a ridiculously high number of uh, frog species throughout the wet tropics, including the green-eyed frog. And the orange thighed frogs. These are the sorts of things that form these enormous choruses uh, after rain with huge numbers or aggregate together near a, near a pond and just form these deafening choruses, thousands of individuals. Of course, not everything is reptiles. Uh, as you're moving through the wet tropics, there's the chance of seeing uh, southern cassowaries, one of our giant flightless birds, and also quite... Uh, quite dangerous if you interfere with them that uh, that bony cask is quite quite a weapon as are the claws so they're very easy to uh, to um to see if you're in the right places and then there's tree kangaroos yes in australia some of our kangaroos have actually climbed up trees we have two species in australia one in the wet tropics one in cape york and then several others in new guinea uh, there's some excellent viewing areas for platypus, one of our egg-laying mammals. And, of course, we've got these beautiful butterflies that are flying around or any of the, any of the sunny gardens and forest glades and so forth. And one of the, the signature species for the Cairns wet tropics area is the Cairns birdwing. And some pretty nice... Comfortable places to stay. Now, moving to the top end of the Northern Territory, it's mostly there's some massive rock outcrops, um, savannah woodlands, mangrove areas. This is in Kakadu National Park, which is a vast uh, wilderness. Temperatures are generally very high here, so you've always got to make sure you've got plenty of water and pace yourself. Fantastic areas for herpetology, both spotlighting at night and also uh, morning and late afternoon walking. And uh, if you are tempted to jump into a lovely cool water hole like this while you're in the in the in the top end, 
well, don't. The uh, saltwater crocodiles, or salties as we call them, uh, are right through the area. There are some safe areas to swim, and there's a lot of areas where you'll see signs saying, you know, do not swim. And if there are no signs at all, assume you can't swim there. Um, we've got the two species up there. This is the the the, the big one, the one that uh, has been responsible for fatalities. And then there's the much more slender fish-eating uh, freshwater crocodile. Some fabulous geckos right through the wet, uh, through the uh, the top end. Um, this velvet gecko occurs on various outcrops across the region with different um, uh, brightly coloured uh, colour variants on different outcrops. Another uh, of our more famous reptiles, the frill neck lizard, uh, typically seen sitting upright on slender uh, trunks like this. Most people photograph them with the frills up. Um, I prefer to just stalk one with a telephoto lens and get these sorts of in situ photos of a nice calm individual. The Merton's water monitor is right through the region. It used to be abundant, but with the introduction of this uh, cane toad I mentioned earlier, numbers have crashed and it's now listed as an endangered species. But there are several areas where they still remain very, very common. Uh, I used to visit the area many, many years ago before the toads were there, and you'd walk along the river banks and you'd hear the, the crash and the plop as it dashes up a trunk and plops into the water. There are still some areas quite close to Darwin where you can still see them fairly easily. Another of the very common monitor lizards in the uh, the top end is the spotted tree goanna. It's quite an urban species throughout the city of Darwin in parks and gardens. And much more secretive, this tiny little northern uh, ridgetail monitor. One of the things that monitor lizards have done in Australia, which they haven't done elsewhere, is evolved dwarfism. This tiny little species this is only 20 centimetres long maximum. Uh, one of the largest skinks in the world, the northern blue tongue. And there's a very diverse python fauna in the in the wet tropics. There's an area called Fog Dam, which I'd like to take people to, which has a, a very, very high um, biomass of water pythons. And there's a, um, a little road that you can drive along that goes right across the dam wall and uh, pythons just crossing backwards and forwards all night. Another of the large top end pythons is the olive python, very common around the uh, rock outcrops and caves and across the open savannah. And the mangroves, you've got to be careful working anywhere near mangroves because there are crocodiles, but there are some areas with a boardwalk where you can see these rear fanged mangrove snakes cruising around on the mud at night. And in the rock out crops, you get these, what we call night tigers or brown tree snakes. Many of the Australian snakes are venomous, but a lot of them have quite weak venom just designed to prey prim uh, primarily on little, little lizards like skinks. And that's the case with this moon snake. Now we're moving into the central Australian desert, and this plant here is called spinifex, and it's one of the triggers for the, the extreme biodiversity in the Australian deserts. Everywhere this tussock of spinifex grows with its interlocking needles of sharp spines, the biodiversity, especially of lizards, goes through the roof. There are species that use it as cover to dash between while they're running around in the daytime. There are species that dig their burrows underneath it, and there are species that live exclusively within it. That includes the jeweled gecko, which is only found inside spinifex clumps. You'll never find one under a stone or up a tree. They're only in those clumps of spinifex. Also living in those clumps, is this Burton snake lizard, very snake-like. It's actually very closely related to geckos. And it's an exclusive lizard eater. So it would be moving in those clumps and between them, uh, hunting any of the lizards that, uh, that it encounters. 
And this is the one that everybody wants to see when they come to Central Australia, the, uh, the thorny devil, Moloch Horridus. It uh, walks like a clockwork clockwork toy with, uh, with jerky little steps as it walks across the roads with its tail curved up across it over its back. It's unmistakable. It's an exclusive anteater. Um, sits beside an ant trail and picks up every ant that runs under its nose. Uh, it has a, 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 each individual has its own latrine site where you can see all the droppings. And I've put some of those droppings under the microscope. Obviously, they're full of ant remains, but the interesting thing is that there's almost no grains of sand. So every dab of that tongue on an ant is a direct hit. They're extraordinary creatures with that false head positioned on the neck. So if it's harassed, it'll tuck its head down and produce that and present that false head. Another one of our pygmy monitors, one of the um, dwarf species, extremely elusive. Um, lucky to see one, but very common to see their tracks uh, moving uh, through the spin effects on the red sand. The first experience I had with these was uh, on a desert sand hill in Central Australia. And I saw the tracks of one and those tracks, when I followed them, moved across and crossed one of my own footprints. And I'd only been there for five minutes. So they knew I was there, but I hadn't seen them. The bearded dragon, um, another famous Australian species, very, very common right across central Australia. You see them sitting on fence posts and stumps and so forth. This is the common one that you will see dashing around between those spin effects clumps, these hyper fast central military dragons. They're great fun to stalk with a telephoto lens. They're an annual, so the, there's a whole population die off each year. And then you get a new generation come through the following year. At night on the desert sand dunes, you'll see these gorgeous knob-tailed geckos. Uh, it never ceases to amaze me how something that appears so translucent and fragile exists in an area with such a, a, a baking sun, high temperature, high daytime temperatures, but it's all about avoiding those extremes, not tolerating them. So by day, it's tucked away in its little burrow down in the, in the moist sand, and then at night they come out and patrol the open sandy areas. Central Australian region is also bisected by uh, some ancient uh, river systems. And when you get into these uh, rocky gorges with the big uh, uh, ghost gums, the, the white trunk eucalypts along the edges, you get into a, a different fauna, which includes Australia's biggest lizard, the Parenti. A uh, very common sight all through those central gorges of the long-nosed dragons. Very fast, great things to watch as they do their head bobs and wave their arms and chase each other, display to each other. And this is Australia's heaviest bodied gecko. It's about the size of a sort of a half-grown rat, I suppose, in its body mass the Centralian knob-tailed gecko. And that ridiculous little tail that you can see there is not a regenerated tail. That's it. That's all it gets. That's the only tail it ever has. Uh, it's one of the few species in the world which can't drop that tail and grow a new one. What's the point? There's nothing to lose. These are fairly easy to find in those rocky areas at night with a headlamp. And then in the open areas, you get the Centralian blue tongue lizard. As far as the snakes go, um, one of the things that everybody likes to see in Central Australia is the Woma python. This is a reptile specialist. Uh, and because it is hunting reptile uh, prey that doesn't give off a body heat, it's one of the one of only two pythons in the world that no longer has those heat sensitive pits that pythons have to locate warm blooded prey. It feeds on things like bearded dragons, goannas, snakes. 
And then we, if the rain comes while you're in Central Australia, then up out of nowhere comes uh, comes frogs in places you could never believe they could possibly exist. And then there's our tiny little marsupials. When you think of Australian marsupials, you think of things like kangaroos, koalas, wombats. But the, the bulk of our small of our marsupials are small insectivores like this little dunnart, mouse-sized. So that's a summary of the fauna that I would be hoping to show you. Uh, there is never a guarantee of seeing anything it's all in the lap of the gods the weather um, but there is always the chance that um, that uh, fate will shine on you and it's very likely that we would see most of the species that I've been able to show you tonight so thank you very much That's great. Thank you so much, Steve. It was a, another really interesting presentation of the weird and wonderful wildlife of Australia. So, um, so yes, yeah, some fantastic um, things that we've got going on there. So we'll now head straight into the Q&A. So hopefully we've still got all of our speakers with us uh, there. Um, so let's see, have we got everyone? We've got Richard there. Um, you got me there. We've got you. I wonder if you can stop sharing your screen there, um, Steve. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Stop sharing. Um, I mean, sorry, stop sharing. There we are. That's okay. That's probably a nicer image that we had there, but <laughs> <laughs> we've got all our pictures there. So, is Tyrone, are you with us again? Yeah, I'm here. Fantastic. Oh. Great. Yeah. And there you go. Your video on there, Steve. Can we see you? Oh. Great, <laughs> lovely. So, yeah, excellent. Some of these Thank things you. do it do it without me asking them to. I didn't <laughs> stop the video. Something triggered oh. and stopped it independently of <laughs> me. Great. So, um, again, to everybody, yeah, please feel free to um, send through more of the questions now. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, we've had a few through privately this evening um, as well, so I can um, ask some of those. Um so first one, probably one for Dan, it's just a sort of a general one about our herpetology holidays. Um, do you need to be um, an expert in amphibians and reptiles or what kind of knowledge do you really need to sort of really enjoy one of these holidays? No, not not at all. And actually one of the motivations of setting up these uh, reptile and amphibian tours was to introduce people that perhaps haven't had the um excellent opportunities that we've had to some of these amazing species that otherwise you wouldn't get to see and um and saw in the presentation so many of them are absolutely exquisite that it's such a treat to be able to see them up close and have the expertise of the leaders um i'm sure they all all agree there super friendly bunch as her pathologists so yeah anyone is welcome and yeah the only consideration of course is you probably saw that uh, a lot of the target species will be active only at night so the night um, aspect of the tour is important and sometimes when you're moving between habitats you know you can of course um, say <laughs> I'm too tired and ha have an early night but that will, you need to weigh that up against the fact that it might be just one or two opportunities in one of the areas of the itinerary to see certain species as we move between habitats. But yeah, certainly we welcome every, everybody who's keen on natural history to join the Habitology Doors. Fantastic, yeah. And I think you can really see the, uh, the passion that's come through from all of our speakers this evening. So I'm sure that will just sort of rub off on anybody who joins the tour, no matter your, your level. So, um, so yeah. Really great answer, thank you. Um, so, Richard, one for you. Um, are there good photo opportunities for wild Japanese uh, giant salamanders? Uh, yes, many. Um, to be honest, some of the best photographs I've ever taken where I just literally get my iPhone and I dip it in the water so it's kind of half um half covered half under the water to stop the kind of reflection element and can take really great photographs because often 
not always, but often they won't hardly move at all. So we can be right up next to them and not cause them any stress or, um, you know, any problems. So often that's the case. Other times we need to approach them a bit, a uh, bit more sensitively, I guess you could say. But um, one thing to bear in mind is that, like I mentioned in the presentation, the water that we find them in because it's often quite shallow. So there's no point kind of bringing huge underwater cameras. We, we don't really have those opportunities. But just a, a GoPro, a, even a, a waterproof smartphone or a, a waterproof camera, you can really take some fantastic shots. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and Tyrone, one for you here. Um, you obviously gave us a fantastic introduction to KwaZulu Natal and, and that kind of area. Um, but I think we offer a tour to the Western Cape as well. And I think you've mentioned you're in Cape Town now, aren't you? So um, do you have sort of any more details of that or how would that differ from, from what you spoke about this evening? So the, the Western Cape, it's almost like day and night in terms of um, the diversity. There's what KwaZulu-Natal lacks in lizard and gecko life. Um, the Western Cape exceeds that with geckos, lizards and tortoises. So it's a completely different it's more of an arid arid region. So if you think more of sort of a, a desert region with succulents and no trees, whereas KwaZulu-Natal, it's lush, tropical, we've got trees and forests. So it's it's completely different. You'd probably actually have to do a good few trips across South Africa to actually get all of the biomes. So uh, there's always there's always another South African trip on the on the agenda, I think, for a real reptile enthusiasts. It's always so much to say. Thank you. Um, there's one for Steve here from Carlos, um, who says, did he see correctly that the olive python has pits in its lower jaw? Are those similar to those of vipers for heat detection? They are similar. They're, they're also quite different. On vipers, you've got a pair of frontal pits. Um, on the pythons, you've got a series of pits along the scales of the upper and lower lips. Um their indentations within the scales. They are, they are heat sensory. The reason these things are set in pits rather than on a flat surface is that uh, infrared heat will cast a shadow in a pit and casting a shadow gives directional ca uh, capacity for heat source detection. So they're very accurate. Interesting, great. Um, and another one for Richard here. Um, what other wildlife would we like to see on that Japan itinerary? Obviously, we've got the salamanders and frogs that you showed as well. But um, yeah, well, what else can we see in the way of other wildlife? As in non non reptiles and amphibians. Non reptiles and amphibians potentially. I guess. <laughs> um, well, in the Totori area, Japanese badgers, um, weasels maybe martins um in okinawa there's a good chance to see the okinawan rail which is a uh, another kind of superstar creature of that region it's a uh, quite a rare species of bird but there's a village that we can visit where there's a good chance to see them on the outskirts of that village what else good question so i mean yeah japanese hare fox, plenty of wild boar. There's uh, bird life, lots of interesting bird life, including the paradise flycatcher. That's a real beauty. It's kind of hard to see, but it's quite easy to hear if you know what you're listening for. And then once we find that, then we can kind of zoom in. Lots of woodpeckers. Yeah. There's, Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's all of our tour specific ones we've got at the moment. Um, but just a final question, really, for Dan. Um, are we working on any new habitology holidays? Um, yeah, so this, yeah, just a few months ago, I took a personal holiday to Amman, and that was uh fantastic for reptiles and amphibians just a wonderful place uh not too dissimilar in habitats and sort of species diversity to our morocco tour which has been hugely popular and successful so that's in the pipeline 
um, and also want to increase our tours in Europe, which again are really popular. So looking at Georgia as a particular country, because not only the beautiful landscapes, but there's a amazing diversity of uh, vipers in particular, some really beautiful species and some beautiful chordates of the newts and salamanders out there too. So, uh, And then there is, of course, one big one still missing from the portfolio, which is Madagascar. So you can certainly expect that to see that one in our portfolio sometime. That's definitely a biggie. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, and just one final question has popped in from Carlos um, to all of the guys. How much time on average would you usually spend out in the field each day? He hopes a lot. Uh, I'm sure most people will as well. <laughs> well, who wants to go first? Um, all right. I, I spend a reasonable amount of time in the field. Next week, I'll be conducting fauna surveys about a thousand kilometres south of here in some semi-arid Mallee woodland, which is uh, small eucalypts with spin effects. So I'm expecting to see pretty high diversity over the next week when I'm down there. Um, just back from a trip into South Australia where we went looking for a, a knob-tailed gecko that's only on one isolated dune system in, in uh, an arid area. We turned up quite a few when we got there. It's all about technique, I suppose. Um, as far as in the field, I guess I'm in the field now. I'm at home, but there's pythons living in my roof. <laughs> um, and there's uh, a water dragon that came into our pergola a couple of days ago. Um, so I'm always I'm, I'm always surrounded by wildlife wherever I go. Fantastic. And so, hi, yeah. Richard. Sort of how much on your nature track yeah. or how long you like to spend, Richard? You want to go for us next? Yeah, I mean, yeah, depending on the on the area, but I would imagine something like six five six hours some days so especially so obviously giant salamanders it's almost impossible not completely impossible to see them during the day but we'll definitely go to the habitat and look for other species such as mamushi viper wrinkle frogs tree frogs that kind of thing and sort of keep an eye out for giant salamanders and then return go back for dinner wait for it to get dark and then go out and same in Okinawa, we generally go out in the morning, have a nice break in the afternoon, which is great in Okinawa because you can go to the beach and relax, you know, in the sun. And then after dark, go back out again. And then, yeah, on a personal note, a lot of time in waders in the river, but <laughs> depending on the season. Great. And Tyrone? Uh, from from my side, it I uh, would say, Carlos. Sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for. Um, on a recent trip uh, that Dan and I have just come back from the last sort of week, ten days, we had some days where Dan will attest to this. Probably 10, 12 hours out in the field. Um, you know, when you're in areas where there's a lot of diversity, especially at night, you can do full days in the field. Obviously, you do lunch for an hour or two, maybe an hour off in the in the afternoon, and then from dusk, you have dinner quickly and then you're out in the field all evening. Um, it also depends on how well or how poor conditions are. Um, you know, when things are really good, you know, when you're doing nocturnal searches, I'm sure both um, Steve and Richard will attest to it. You know, when you're finding lots of animals, you don't just say, oh, it's 10 p.m. We better head back in. You know, if you're finding animals, you, you carry on going. Um, and then, you know, you always balance it out. If you have a really late night, the night previous, you know, you can maybe push dinner, uh, push breakfast to seven thirty and sort of seven. Um, but it all it really depends on the group and how um, you know how enthusiastic people want to go. So it, yeah, we can have it easy or you can push it full tilt. But um, after fourteen days, you might you might need a holiday after your herping holiday. So you got to take it easy. That's great, thanks. Um, you have to manage the conditions too. Um, um say in the top end of the Northern Territory where conditions are, per are perpetually uh, high temperatures, uh, you pace yourself, you know, mid middle of the day, early afternoon, you're probably just sitting in the shade or back at your accommodation or something like that. So you're functioning uh, early morning and then late afternoon and into the night. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and then just one, another question has popped in from Jocelyn, um, probably for Dan. How big are the groups normally for these herpetology holidays? Mm, that's a really good question actually um 
Yeah, so different to most of our birds and mammal tours, um, just the nature of the tours means that they're often smaller group sizes. I mean, not for every tour, like our tours in Europe, um, Peloponnese, which I've led myself, is um, really nice in a in a sort of almost a normal group size, so up to 14. But most groups um, are around six to nine, I'd say. But if there's a tour you're thinking about in particular, then please do um, write to my email address, which I think will be displayed at the end, and I can tell you sort of the, the maximum number for that particular tour or any tours. Fantastic. Thanks, Dan. And so I think that does actually bring us to the end, end of all of our questions. So thank you again to um, all of our speakers. I know it's um, an ungodly hour for a lot of you there, so we really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us this evening. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening. Um, so as I said, that is the last one of our online roadshow presentations for this year, um, but we'll be back in January with South America. Um, we'll also be doing some in-person roadshows in January as well. So we'll get a full list of those out to you after these presentations. Um, but um, but yeah, th thanks very much for, for joining us. And it um, seems a little bit early, but I wish you all a Merry Christmas. Um, and we'll be back in the new year. Thanks very much, everyone. Yeah, no yes. Thank you. All right. Good to meet you all, folks. You too, Steve. Lovely to meet you. Likewise. Okay. Thank you. Be in touch. Okay. I'm logging out now. Cheers. Cheers, Richard. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Sleep. <laughs>